So we're going to talk about faster and more secure web fonts. And really, there are four elements to this talk. Uh, so first, we're going to go into a little bit of the, the history of how we get from the earliest sort of web fonts technology to uh, today, which we have WAF, and then uh, like what comes next. Uh, we're going to talk about methods to, um, to optimize and make your web fonts faster and to deploy your own web fonts. Uh, we're going to talk about some problems that exist in some browsers. And we're going to talk about what the future holds for web fonts, which is pretty interesting. So uh, let's begin by talking about history. So uh, first of all, people have been trying to use fonts on the web or on embedded device for a really, really long time. And um, in fact, you know, 2000 and 2005 is sort of like the year that I put here. But in fact, the technology actually lasts way longer than that. And this is probably the first one. Um, it's from Bitstream, which is a company that resells and, and, and make fonts. And uh, they have a technology called TrueDoc. Uh, that actually, surprisingly enough, they embed fonts to use on like TV set-top boxes. So this is the days when, these were the days when, uh, you remember like internet TV, right? Like maybe like 15 years ago, people hyped up about like, well, you like install this set-top box, you plug it in, connect it to an ethernet, and then you, you know, like you access, you can browse internet on your TV, right? Uh, so this, because the TV doesn't have like embedded fonts, like the set-top box it, we're, we're, is, is going to sort of provide that font, right? So Bitstream has the technology to like um, to embed fonts into the set-top boxes to be used on TVs. And that's sort of where the earliest sort of like font embedding technology came from. It's pretty advanced. It does multiple uh, language scripts. It actually renders pretty well. And it happens to render very well in browser as well. Because guess what? If you have a, an internet set-top box, you're going to uh, have a browser because you need to browse the internet. So. Um, it's compatible with Netscape 4 and Netscape 6 and uh, the browser, Mozilla 1.0. Uh, uh, so that was TrueDoc. And next, we come into Microsoft, because Microsoft got interested in this idea. And they call it something like Embedded Open Type, or EOT is the file format. The extension is, in fact, EOT. Uh, the development stopped in 2008, but it worked in uh, you know, it worked all the way from IE4. So if you're looking for um, like browser compatibility, you can actually like generate an EOT file and use it in IE4, 5, and 6. And like, you know, like things that don't support WAF actually supports EOT. So if you're looking for a solution that like scales back, EOT is sort of like the way to go, even though it's interesting because it's not supported anymore, but there you go. Uh, so EOT is, is it basically used as a subset. I'll, I'll talk about subset in a little while. But it combines the fact that a font can be made smaller by splitting it into multiple parts and then compressing those little multiple parts so they get downloaded faster, saves more bandwidth, loads faster, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, uh, the problem is um, there's a, the decryption method is not open. It's actually, in, in fact, it's proprietary. And it's a secret that's sort of uh, held by Microsoft. And this is the reason why. Um, licensing became complex, and the technology never uh, got adoption. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this, uh, right? So Cipher is pretty simple, where you load a page, you designate some ID or some class or some div. It's like, hey, look, I want to um, replace this text with uh, a flush element, and then replace that flush element, and then render, render text on it, right, using a custom font. Create a flash movie, you draw it with action script, et cetera, et cetera. It was popular, but then it's abandoned because you know it doesn't work for long text, right? So like if you try to implement a long body of text using Cipher, you can select it, you can copy and paste, right? Because back then flash is is um is sort of not 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 very good. So and plus the ad blocker issue. Um the next solution is Kufan. Some of you might uh, might realize this, right? In 2009. So the way that Kufan works, right? Um, it's basically you have a uh, true type or open type font format, right? That is converted to like SVG because browsers can, you know, like browsers actually supports SVG, right? From a pretty long time ago. So it's, it's an Adobe standard, but like browsers support it a long time ago. So they pass it, they convert the font into SVG, and then the SVG is rendered to like an HTML5 canvas element, right? So it's not like a, you know, so it's like SVG rendered into canvas element. 
uh, and the drawing is then done into a separate rendering engine on JavaScript. So it's actually pretty sort of like it's pretty complicated. It's not hacky. You can actually select like a Kufan block of text and copy and paste. So it's pretty uh, uh, simple. So Kufan was sort of going successful, except that it it requires due to its licensing, it actually requires every font that is used with Kufan to also have a generous distribution license. And if you know type foundries, um, they want a secure solution that won't leave their fonts in jeopardy, where somebody can just like go in, download a font file, install it in their computer, and just rip off fonts on the web, right? Because I can do, like, what's stopping me from doing a Google search for, like, give me opensense.ttf, right? And then, like, oh, Google finds it for me, I'll just download it, right? So Kufan's not secure that way, because by design, it's, it has an open license, it's sort of like a GNU license, right? It's like an open license, but then I have to also, the font has to be released like that. So we'll go over WAF a little bit later, because that's sort of the solution that everybody adopts today. Um, but that's sort of the, the, the short history of how we got here today. So next we're going to talk about three methods to uh, make your, uh, to sort of like deploy your own fonts and, and make your web fonts faster as well. So first we're going to talk about subsetting. So what's subsetting? So subsetting means splitting one font file into multiple parts and just discarding the parts that you don't need. We're going to talk about embedding. And embedding means, uh, I mean, today, these days, it means converting the font into a base 64, you know, and coding it into a base 64 thing. Uh, which actually the browser renders pretty, you know, like faster than a, than a, than a TTF or an OTF file, uh, versus just directly linking to the font file, right? So instead of like saying in the CSS, hey, give me the font TTF, you say in the CSS, well, here's the data file. So you have a larger CSS rather than a larger font file. And third, we're going to talk about WAF and compressing using WAF. So, um, I did a presentation like this about two years ago when WAF was sort of still, you know, like it's not sort of final that WAF is going to be the standard or like what, you know, like different web font services came about. So my principle two years ago is that, hey, look, if you're going to embed a font in the web, it should be just like a plain TTF or like a plain OTF because every browser supports it. Let's not worry about any encryption or, or decryption or any sort of proprietary stuff because it creates the best user experience. So what do I mean by the best? Well, uh, it's the fastest. Like two years ago, browsers weren't sort of fast enough in, in interpreting base64 encoded data, for instance, right? It's most compatible at that time with, you know, with like Chrome, with, with the early Chrome, with Firefox and with uh, Internet Explorer. And um, it's also least complex, which means less bugs, right? Of course, that principle is not true today because Font foundries and font distribution channels and web developers, you know, everybody has to sort of agree that, hey, look, WAF is the way to go, so let's use that. Base64 embedding is also the way to go, so let's use that. So they've sort of agreed on some sort of a stack that everybody develops. Um, everybody sort of does it the same way. There might be, um, different optimization that comes from, oh, I'm using like, Amazon's AWS, or I'm using my own server, you know, I split my fonts the same way, I split my fonts a different way. But really, the method is sort of the same. So you go to Google Web Fonts, or you go to Typekit, you go to every font provider out there, and this, you know, they use the same sort of technology stack. But this means that very few people are doing it themselves, right? Like, I sort of do it myself in sort of my small experimental website, but if I'm going to deploy, like, a large website, I probably would rely on a third-party service, right? Because it's just simpler. It's just like one line of JS. So I think it helps to sort of know how to do it. So you, so you sort of know how it works. And even then, if you work or if you use a third-party service, then you know how it works, right? So let's talk about subsetting. So what does subsetting mean? Well, uh, it's splitting one font file into multiple parts, obviously. Um, but you can also split it logically, right? And this is what it means. So every font has a Unicode. For example, this is the Unicode for the basic Latin character sets, which just has punctuations, right, uppercase, lowercase, uh, numerical characters. Uh, this is the Latin one supplement, right, which has, you know, all sort of like the diacritics, additional uh, punctuations, um, and it has the currency symbol, right, the maths, the number forms, punctuations, you know, all of that. So all of this is sort of the Unicode standard. So a font has a big Unicode table, and 
basically we're going to split fonts into like logical parts and just load the parts that we need. No surprise there, most web fonts provider has this. If you go to Google Fonts, it actually asks you, hey, are you going to be using Latin? Are you going to be using Greek? Right? Are you going to be using whatever? Right? Uh, so the thinking goes that if you don't need to use Greek, don't select Greek. And so you can avoid downloading like a 500 kilobyte font file and just have the Latin if you just need Latin. Right? So. This is where I get my uh, Unicode range, which I insert into my CSS. And this is how the code works. We are going to use a CSS Unicode range property. This is a standard CSS, right? It's just a standard CSS. I'm just embedding the font in sort of a naked way, just like linking to the font. And here we go. There's the special bit. So I'm going to specify that, hey, look, uh, for this font, I only, you know, like this font only contains the basic Latin character sets and nothing else, right? So this makes the font loads faster. This, this tells the website, this tells the client machine which character is loaded. Uh, in Google Web Fonts, you use this, which is, you know, which is a more sort of like readable format, right? So in Google Fonts, you can say, hey, I just want the Latin one, right? Uh, also in Unicode, you can just say, look, I just want so Unicode, so that's Unicode uh, 41, right? Uh, that's code for uh, capital letter A. So this is the same. If this is, if you do it in font face, this is how you do it. If you do it in Google, you do it this way, right? So really, the real benefit actually comes from the fact that a lot of documents are really just set in one language or not a few languages, which means that, hey, look, if you don't need to use, uh, you know, like if you don't need your website to be set in 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 Greek. Or, or Cyrillic characters or Vietnamese, then don't use that, right? And just make it smaller. So just load what you use. And um, let, me, let, me, let me tell you what that means. So I'm going to go to a demo now. I use an open source program called FontForge. And I have loaded a font. Let me see which I will pull here. Oh, there we go. Minimize. Okay, FontForge. All right, all right, sweet. You know, it's a FontForge is sort of not designed to be to be pretty, but you know, you just gotta work with what you got. So let me just move it. Just window. We open the file. Ah, uh, there it is. Okay, so let me let me just open a font right here. Uh, let me see library desktop right hands. Ah, there we go. Right. So uh, in this example, I'm just gonna open a font called Droid Sans, right? And let me just make the um, view. Let me just make this a little smaller. There you go. Right. Sweet. Okay, so this is FontForge, and really, subsetting is no more than this, right? Oh, I only need to use just the uppercase and the lowercase. I'm just going to select this, and I'm just going to abandon the rest, right? So basically, you just um, select all the other characters, and then you just right-click, and then you clear it. And you just say, yep. Oh, let me see. Let me just move there. You know, just say yes, and then you... And then you export the file, and then you generate a font, and then you generate a font, and then you save it, or or you can or you can make a save as, but then you just generate a font, and then you call it something else, right? But it's subsetting is no more than that, right? Because uh, uh you know, for example, in this example, Droid Sans has multiple characters, and yet I'm just selecting a Latin one, right? And you can do this yourself, or you know what the uh, third-party uh, sort of web fonts provider does is they essentially automate this process for you so that what happens is then they create something like this, right? What happens is they create something like this. Uh, you know, like this is the Droid Sans, right? And then they split it. Oh, I just want Droid Sans with just symbols. I want one with just numbers. I want one with lowercase. I want one with, you know, different character sets. And then they put it behind checkbox, right? So really, sort of, this is sort of what they do. And it's nothing more simple than that. So you can do it yourself. 
using open source tools and sort of just deploy your own web, you know, you deploy your own web fonts and it doesn't have to be slow, right? So that is subsetting. So really, really simple. And here's the result from a tech, you know, from a test that I do for uh, Droid Sans. So Droid Sans has all of this uh, characters. The full size, this is the regular weight, is 217 kilobyte. So when I split it into just the Latin character that I need, it's, you know, the size improvement is dramatic, right? 36 kilobyte, 80 kilobytes. Even if I just subset it to a serial characters, which also has a lot of characters, again, it's smaller than that 217. The Greek is also smaller. The Vietnamese is smaller, right? So again, just by splitting fonts into multiple parts and just not loading everything else that you don't need, you're just going to get a better performance. So now, what if we subset it further, right? So sure, we only use Latin, but let's subset it again. So this is Latin. This is the, you know, this is the basic Latin character sets. So why don't we split it into uppercase and lowercase numerals and punctuations, right? So, you know, what's stopping me from doing that? Well, in fact, it's pretty easy to do. So again, this is the CSS code. So instead of doing just one font file, right? Now I'm, I, I want to do multiple ones, right? So I want Gentium 1, I want Gentium 2, and I want Gentium 3. These are just file names that you can sort of just rename sort of arbitrarily. And then in the CSS body, you call it this way. I want Gentium 1, which contains the lowercase, right? And then if I type an uppercase and that uppercase is sort of not available in the Gentium 1 font, then change into Gentium 2. So it's just standard CSS font stack. You're nothing tricky going on, we're just splitting one font into different uh, constituents. And here's one result, here's, here's my result, because I, I actually split it into uppercase, lowercase, punctuation, numerals. So again, I'm just using the Latin and Latin extended character sets, and this is my original size, and then I split it. This is, you know, as you can see, now the fonts are super light. And what's really interesting is that when you split it into many parts, the more you split, the less efficient it is, right? So suddenly, it's a question of like, well, how much do you want to split it and benefit from that parallel loading? Because, you know, if you load like, you know, like 10 or 5 different 5 kilobyte files, that's probably going to be faster than loading one 100 kilobyte files, right? So can you benefit from parallel loading while still keeping your sizes small? And it turns out that the more you split, the less efficient it is. And I tested the time as well using the web inspector. And um, if I just load one set with everything, that's my timing, 1.85 seconds. And if I have the multiple subset that I load everything, it's actually faster, right? So that's interesting because it's like, well, it is actually rendered faster. Uh, it doesn't get downloaded faster, right? Which is very interesting. So the benefit here is not only is it more secure, but this time, if somebody decides to sort of like grab a font off your site, right? He can grab an uppercase or a lowercase, right? And in order to reconstruct that uppercase and lowercase together and put it into like a usable font, he has to download like five or ten different fonts and then open up FontForge and then copy and paste the character into a new font file and then save it into a new font file, which is not very efficient, right? So as you can imagine, this makes it very sort of like it's harder to hack. It's possible, but it's harder. So of course, the aggregate size of the subsetted files are larger. And you can benefit from parallel loading, but it kind of still uses more bandwidth. It's not a lot of bandwidth, but it's more bandwidth, which if you are operating on a mobile environment, on like a 2G, 3G internet connection, is going to be bad. Um, and also the additional benefit is there's the flash of unstyled text, right, which older Firefox versions used to have. So if you're targeting older Firefox, you're going to have this problem, but probably not today. Uh, it's also hard to generate and maintain because imagine for that Droid Sans, right? I mean, I chose to split it into like five or six different parts, right? And what happens is that, hey, look, it's, it's, it's really hard to do. Uh, it takes a lot of time, lots of manual work. And so really what you want to do is just have enough subset files, right? Most web font services, if you are wondering, uses just two. They just split the font in two and they just, you know, that way they benefit from parallel loading without making the sizes large. That's upsetting, right? The second one is embedding. Embedding is pretty simple. I have a font called Gentium. This is the URL. And instead of the URL, I pass it through a Base64 encoder. And then I have that, right? So it's pretty simple. You can find Base64 encoder and decoder online. 
Uh, it'll convert this for you. Just you know, upload a font file to them, and then it'll give you the uh, the data. In fact, I have one right here that I that I passed by. All right, let's see if this works. See, so in this case, I just browse for a file, right? So this is the Droid Sans, and it gives me the thing that I just copy and paste into my CSS. Pretty simple, all right? Okay. So again, I benchmarked everything. So here's linked. Here's just if I link to a TTF file, this is what it does. And if I embed it, it's dramatically faster, right? So uh, there are several benefits to embedding your font, and this is why you should do it. It reduces the amount of HTTP page requests, and it's better for page performance. The CSS can be cached. Sometimes font files like load over and over again. Uh, it's also harder to pirate because you have to decode it. You know, like in, you know, you have to decode it back. And that's embedding. It's really simple. A lot of font uh, providers use this. And so now let's combine this, right? Subsetting plus embedding. So what does that look like? Well, here we go. So I'm comparing the performance of just one sub, you know, one set versus splitting the font into multiple subset. And then I'm also comparing the fact that I'm linking to one as a TTF file. And in the other hand, I have multiple CSS files that are just embedded. So it's really large CSS files, right? So this is what it does. So uh, on the upper bar, I have one set and multiple subsets. And in there, I have linked and embedded. This is how, if you embed your own fonts, this is probably what you're going to get. This is just draw it sans TTF, link it in your CSS. You're making two requests, right? One request for the page, the other request for the font. This is the size, and that's the loading time. Multiple subset is what I talk about. It's like method number one, right? It's we're going to split the fonts into multiple constituent parts. Um, this time we're making one HTML5 request, you know, one HTML page request and five font requests, right? It's smaller requests, but it's a bunch of requests. It's a larger file size. That's the number. Uh, I'm embedding this time, right? So if I embed it in the file, I just chose to embed it in, in the HTML file just to sort of be quick and dirty. I'm just making one request. I'm not calling any CSS. I just embed it there. And uh, it's much smaller, and it's much faster. And this time, I choose to embed. I choose to like split and then embed it into, the, you know, like into my HTML file. This is what I get. And this is the rendering. Uh, sorry, this is the page loading. So now let's compare it, right? And so, what do we learn for this? Well, the more you split, and the more you split embed, the benefit, again, like the, the benefits diminish the more, right? The, the more you do it. So don't split it into too many parts. Use two, that's sort of my recommendation. Uh, most services use two, three at the maximum, use two. And really, that's sort of what would we learn, right? It's that number one, if you embed a font using like a base64 thing, it's always going to be faster. In most cases, with modern browsers, it's always going to be faster than linking to the file. And thing number two that we learn is that when you split the files, the more you split it, the less efficient it is. So don't split too much, right? So that's the second method. That's embedding. So method number three also makes sense, right? It's compressing. It's just by using WAF. So what is what is WAF, right? Like people have been talking, like, oh, like how is WAF different from other proprietary format? Well, WAF is nothing more than an open type file that you pass through a compressing algorithm that you add some metadata block. So a foundry can add their metadata, like their copyright information, the font weight, their license information. They can add that to the WAF file, right? And then a WAF file is decoded, not sort of like not service, it's decoded by the user agent, which means it cannot be installed on your desktop, right? You can double click on a WAF file, it doesn't do anything, so it protects like Font Foundry from piracy. A WAF file is kind of, it's not impossible, but it's kind of impossible to like convert a WAF back to a TTF, while it's possible to convert a TTF to a WAF, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you can do it, sometimes it fails, right? So it's sort of not reliable and therefore it prevents piracy. So Font Foundry is like it for this reason. And the history of WAF, actually WAF is not very new. Uh, in sort of early to mid-2009, uh, three guys uh, came up with two sort of solutions to solve the web font problem. They call it Zot and .webfont file format. And 
it turns out that uh, those two formats get a lot of traction. Again, this is just mid-2009. Those things get a lot of traction from a lot of foundries. And this is really crucial, right? Because before the WAF format came about, all the solution that was talked about in the industry either comes from like a font foundry or like one font foundry, and then the other font foundries don't want to implement it. Or it came from Microsoft, and then it has like a licensing issue that like, oh, nobody wants it, right? So it always comes from that. But this time, a lot of font foundries does it. So suddenly, it's gotten sort of a lot of, of, of acceptance. In mid-2009, it quickly got combined into a new thing called Web OTF, right? And Web OTF became WAF. Pretty simple. And um, again, around mid-2009, Mozilla endorsed it and implemented in the browser. In early 2010, it's endorsed by Microsoft and Opera. And keep in mind, this has just been like six months, you know, like six months to a year since the specification first came about. And in early 2010, it's, it's you know, it's uh, submitted to W3C, endorsed by Microsoft and Opera. And then between 2010 and 2011, it's supported in all major browsers. IE support sort of came later, but it, it, it's sort of supported in all major browsers. It's pretty easy converting a font from TTF to WAF. You can use these online tools. Font Squirrel helps, helps a lot. Um, I use the command line tool just because I like command line. You don't have to use it. And um, compressing is pretty easy. So I use a tool called TTF to WAF that I just downloaded. I think I just downloaded it via GitHub. So let me just quit the um, Squarts. Quit. There you go. All right. I have this. All right, sweet. So, you know, so it's just TTF to off. I'm just going to give it a thing to verbose. And here's the font, right? Here's a, t here's a good old TTF font. And yeah, I'm just going to uh, convert it into WAF. Just convert it into Dwight Sands WAF. There you go. It converts. And as you can see, the file size just reduces dramatically, right, from like 108. You know, it's like 108 kilobytes down to like 61. So that's a saving of 56.7%, right? I did nothing to the file, right? And then, of course, it then generates a WAF file, which is right here. And as you know, a WAF file can open it, can install it, right? Because it's decoded by user agent. If I call it in the browser, then the browser knows how to encode it. So, sorry, to decode it, but my computer can't do it. And that's the um, uh, conversion from TTF to WAF. Again, it's, it's pretty simple, right? You can use online tools to do it. Lots of tools to do this. So now, let's combine it, right? What if we combine subsetting and embedding and, and, and compressing? So we know this already. We did some tests to this. And now let's compare TTF and WAF. So as you know, this is our TTF data, right? And this is the loading time for TTF. And now let's look at WAF, right? What's the loading time for WAF? Well, here's the size. Loading time is 0 0.99 seconds, less than one second, right? So here's the numbers. You can look at the presentation later. And here it is, right? But let's see the numbers in context and see what we learned from them. Uh, so the TTF is going to be the upper figure. The WAF is going to be the lower figure. And here we go. That's the uh, size comparison. And as you can see, WAF saves space a lot, right? In different situations, WAF saves space a lot compared to TTF. And it's also faster, right? WAF is also faster. So what do we learn? Well, there's no reason not to use WAF, right? It's pretty simple to do. Online tools can do it. If you use a third-party tool, they automatically use WAF. So why not do it? And um, here's something interesting. If you use WAF, it doesn't matter whether you link to the file or embed to the file, because WAF is already compressed, right? So base64 embedding, you don't actually have to use that base64 embedding, because hey, a client computer can install a WAF file anyway, so why put it into a, another, uh, what is it, uh, decoding or, or encoding and decoding method, right? Base64. So it's already compressed, so you don't need to do base64 if you use WAF. Interesting. Uh, and again, when you embed, right? So the, again, like right, like the the um, the vertical one refers to like linked and embedded, right? So so embedding will generally be faster. Again, this proves that embedding is always faster than linking, even though at this point the uh, time and size difference is kind of uh, it's kind of a little. And uh, again, when we look at WAF files that I split into multiple subsets, 
the more subsets I do, the worse performance it is. All right? So that's WAF, or at least that's WAF 1.0. 1, 1 so later we're going to talk about WAF 2.0 if we have some time. Uh, no promises there. So that's the three methods that we talk about. It's upsetting, splitting one, one file into multiple parts, just using the language or the characters that you need, discarding the rest. Um, we have embedding, which is sort of embedding a font file in base64 file format, encoding it, letting the user agent decode it, uh, versus linking to the naked font file. And lastly, we have compressing by using WAF. So that's sort of the method. All right, so now we're going to talk about some problems, uh, which I think any of us knows is a flash of unstyled text, right? So what Firefox used to do, really, is that when it finishes loading the page, it'll just load the page in, like, your default serif font or sans serif font. So it'll just load the page in Arial, Helvetica, Times New Roman, Georgia, et cetera, et cetera. And after the font is loaded, then it'll flash. And it'll change the font. The text will reflow. And it creates a really sort of, you know, a really bad user experience. So Mozilla fixed it in 2011, and now the behavior is the same across all modern browser. It's the same with Opera. Now that Opera uses Blink, it's the same with, uh, with Chrome as well, right? It's the same with IE. So now this is no longer a problem. However, right, now that you, you don't have the flash of unstyled text, this means that you don't see text until the font is fully loaded, right? So what happens is that until the font is fully loaded, it's just going to be a blank page, and you won't see anything until, you know, you, you load that, like, 100 kilobytes worth of file, so you don't see any text. And therefore, if you're on a mobile device, you're just going to see, like, some image and, like, a blank page, and you don't know. You expect the site to be broken. You quit it. You don't use the site anymore, right? So how do you make loading time as fast as possible? Well, first of all, you separate the font CSS, right? So rather than have one CSS file that contains all the uh, embedded base64 format, you separate it. You just separate, you know, you have like a separate CSS font file for uh, the basic Latin, separate CSS font file for Cyrillic, separate ones for Greek, right? Whatever you use, whatever subsets you use, separate it into files so they can load parallelly, right? So that makes sense. Uh, maximize expired headers if you have control over the cache, obviously, because CSS can be cached, right? So it makes sense to not download it over and over again. Uh, this is an interesting idea, is uh, why don't we do, you know, deploy a JavaScript that can load the page without the font, right? Because then it's faster, right? It's just using whatever um, text you use or whatever font you use, specify in the browser, and when the page is downloading, load the font. But then I guess, right, after you load the font, then the font is not going to, you know, the font is not going to flash. So when you reload the page again, the font shows instantly, right? So this is an interesting solution. I'm not sure. I think it's worth trying. I haven't tried it, but that's an interesting solution. And this thing is actually also interesting, right, is just make it responsive. If you do Android, then don't, you, you know, like if you know that you're targeting a slow Android device on a 2G connectivity, hey, don't use like your own web fonts just in your, in your uh, CSS file. Just specify, hey, I just want to use Droid Sans or Open Sans or whatever font file comes with Android, right? So make the font responsive as well. There's no reason why a font can't be responsive, right? If the size is small, again, like maybe if the size is small, maybe I won't load any fonts. If the size gets bigger, maybe I'll just load one font. If it's on the desktop, then maybe I'll load all the fonts ever, right? So again, it's just responsive design with fonts. And that's how you solve the problem of, of this, this like flash of unstyled text, right? It's been resolved, and that's how you resolve that problem of not seeing content before the fonts loaded. The next one that we're going to talk about is the future. It's going to be a really short section. We're going to talk about two things. But first, uh, the one that we're going to talk is the uh, Network Information API. This is a uh, relatively new uh, proposal at the W3C. You can see the um, you can see the proposals online. And really, it just allows you to target uh, different bandwidths. And now I can say, hey, look, if the connection bandwidth is more than two megabytes, then show the HD image. If it's less, show the uh, you know show the uh, lower quality image. It's the same as uh, I suppose it's the same as like a retina sort of targeting thing, right? It's like oh, if the display density is two, then show an at 2x. Otherwise, you show a regular image. 
So network information APIs, really helpful. I think it's going to be implemented in browsers. It might be implemented in Chrome Canary. I'm not sure. But uh, it's something to try, which is really interesting. Uh, so it allows you to target just different bandwidths, different connectivity. Uh, the second one is WAF 2.0, which is really interesting uh, because it saves space from WAF 1.0 by about like 20 to 30 percent. So we sort of like don't care about this, but if you care about the technicality, you can ask them later. But basically, this means that the way that fonts are encoded in WAF 1, you know, 1.0 right now, it contains a lot of redundant or duplicate information. And what WAF 2.0 does is it sort of, sort of eliminates that redundancy, eliminates that those empty blocks, those empty Unicode blocks. It eliminates repeating information and just condenses it even more. Right? It uses a new, um, uh, several different compression engines were tested. This is the first, if you remember Microtype Express from like page 9 or 10 that was back in like 1992 or whatever. Uh, that got used again, and that got tested, but apparently it's not royalty free. Um, the perform, even though the compression is pretty good, right? It's like 24.96%. The performance, it only performs at one sixth the uh, the performance, right? So if you're a type foundry and you want to implement this, it's gonna take you're, you're gonna have a bad time. It's gonna take a long time to convert your whole library into WAF 2.0. The second one. Uh, that I think they're going to um, implement is Microsoft Express. Again, it's like the same thing, uh, but it's a new um, compression alg algorithm called Broadly. I won't go into detail, um, but it's open source. Uh, it's fairly well documented because it's actually based off a, uh, a compression algorithm that is also like back in the 90s called Flight. But you can actually deploy it yourself if you want. Check it out. It's fun dash compression dash reference, you can actually test it by enabling these flags in Chrome and just loading Google fonts, right? And that's it for me. And we talk about four things today, uh, which is the history. We talked about methods, right? We talk about like subsetting, embedding, and, and um, uh, compressing. We talk about some problems to alleviate um, that flash of unstyled text and not seeing content before. And we talked about the WAF 2.0 and the uh, network information API that can like speed up loading fonts even more. And um, that is how you make your web fonts faster and also more secure. There's the back channel if we don't have time for questions. Otherwise, uh, there's my email and it's really dark, but it's Brahm at Mozilla. Send me questions. Hey. Brahm, thanks. That, that was very comprehensive. and. Uh, I have a lot of questions. I've even forgotten some of the questions by the time you finished. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask you quickly uh, is, um, you mentioned the bandwidth API that's in browsers. Can't that be put into CSS? Sorry? Uh, the bandwidth API that lets you ask the browser yeah. what bandwidth it has. Yeah. That would have been really nice if that was in CSS because then it becomes part of your responsive style sheets. I know, right? I know. Yeah. yeah. It should. It should be. I mean. I mean. I looked at the. Uh, I look at the spec. I look at the spec sheet, and it's. It's like JS. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand either. I don't understand why. I, I hope though, I hope they brought it into CSS because that will be nice. Because one of the, um, one of the other feature that it can detect is can, is it can also detect whether a connection is offline or not. And that's really nice. Or right? if you can detect that in the CSS, you can say, oh, if it's offline, then make it this way. Yeah. Okay. The other thing is, um, you know, Chrome's been broken for a while. Uh, you're not from Chrome. You're not responsible for it. But, uh, Essentially, embedded fonts don't work in Chrome as of today. You know, uh, they never worked in Windows, uh, but Chrome for the last couple of months has been broken. The fix is due in the first week of March. Uh, but it's been broken for a while, and essentially it's an idle timeout. You know, the Chrome doesn't cache. Uh, the current version of Chrome does not cache web fonts. So it, it flushes them from the cache after they've been there for a few minutes. Oh, shoot. And okay. essentially any idle tab loses its fonts. Um, how many of you guys have experienced this? That's it. You guys haven't noticed that Chrome can't render fonts anymore? <laughs> so the other thing is that's curious is you know Chrome can't render fonts on Windows anyway. Um, if you use Windows and you use embedded fonts, it looks really shitty with Chrome. It looks great in Internet Explorer, great in Firefox, but bad in Chrome. Um, and this is kind of sad for the fonts industry. I mean, the leading browser, Chrome, has more than 50% of the market share now, and they just can't render fonts. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, embedded has become 
sort of the preferred way. I mean, that's the way that you make it secure, right? Because then you have to decode it as well. So I, it's like it's not going to change. It's always going to be embedded and split. So it's going to be WAF. It's going to be embedded in Base64. It's going to be split into multiple parts. So I guess you can file a bug. File a bug. I don't know. The bug is well known. It's uh, it just millis uh, missed a couple of release cycles, so it's due for March. The bug is actually fixed in Canary. It's okay. just not in stable. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's the switch from from Blink. You know, switch from WebKit to Blink. Maybe. Well, instantly. You now, the other thing I mentioned, uh, I wanted to ask you about, is that you said WAF is secure because there's no app that can open it, but the code to deal with the WAF file is already in a browser. It's not going to be that hard for someone to take it out and make it standalone. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think like all three compression methods works best when you. Um, when you deploy them, you know, when you deploy, when you deploy all three of them, right? Because if you just have WAF, then again, it's just really easy to decode. Just, just use that command line tool and replace that TTF with WAF, right? Like it's done. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, but I think it works if you first split it, right? And then you convert it to WAF. And then you, uh, what is it? And, and then you like encode it into base64. Because then if I want to seal the fonts, what I have to do is like, First, I have to decode it into, uh, you know, to base64 to a WAF file. I have to figure out a way to convert that WAF file into TTF. And then after that, I have to open like a font program because I only get the lowercase or the uppercase. So it's kind of like, oh, it's too much hassle. But really, like, there's nothing, sp there's nothing stopping you. You can like, you can actually do that. Um, yeah. Ram, hi. Uh, one question here, instead of uh, serving our own fonts, how does one take a decision on using something like Typekit and Google Fonts because there is a good chance that other users on other websites are also calling fonts from the same service and hence the browsers might have it cached. So it's the CDN argument, right? Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, Google Fonts is sort of like, a, Google Fonts is a fine alternative. A lot of people use it and again, right, as you said, if somebody has the font and then somebody uses Google font, um, it's all also going to be going to be cached. So what's stopping you from using it? Well, as it turns out, at Mozilla we couldn't use. For example, at Mozilla we use sort of our own CDN, and we don't use Google fonts, even though we use Open Sans, for instance, right, in all our websites. So why can't we do that? Well, because Google's data policy. I mean, like Google might might do something with the cache, right? Because it, it knows like which computer or like which types of browser opens and loads their web fonts. And I don't know what Google is going to do with that data, right? So that's why we deploy our own, right? So that's sort of a concern, sort of using Google Web Fonts, even though it is faster. It is good. They're doing all this stuff to make it more performant. So if privacy is and and privacy and data handling is your concern, then maybe using Google Web Fonts is sort of like not sort of like not such a good idea. I think one like security sort of centered company or security centered website worried about this. Like, oh, we use Google Web Fonts. Like, can we do this? Because it sends data to Google. Are we OK with this? So that's one concern. Uh, the second concern is that uh, sometimes the font quality, you know, other than the fonts that Google has commissioned, like Open Sans, you know, is, 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 is really good. Droid Sans, right, is good. Aside from those exceptions, right, you kind of get what you paid for, which means that if you actually buy fonts, and then you deploy the fonts that you buy using whatever third-party service or deploy it yourself, it's probably going to be better because, I mean, somebody paid a lot of money to, to do it. And you actually license that font versus using a font that Google uh, has, which is free. And not that open source is bad. It's actually very good. But a lot of the stuff is just not sort of high quality. In small sizes, they don't render as well. You open it in like a Windows machine, and it looks like anemic, like it's about to fall apart, and, and stuff like that. So, so you get those issues with with Google Fonts and and stuff like that. So that's sort of the argument against it. But hey, if you use Open Sans, then use Google Fonts, right? It makes sense. Thanks. Hi. Um, have you had experience subsetting um, fonts with open type features? I'm using fonts.com as my fonts supplier. Yeah. Uh, I do get tons, I mean, huge sizes of WAF and all those files. Yeah. I, I use some of them, especially for their open type features, yeah. but of course they run into huge sizes. I mean, run into maybe a megabyte yeah. when I consider all the italics and all the variants of the yeah. font. Yeah. So would I be, in, would you know if I'm in the clear if I subset those fonts that I get from fonts.com? And have you had any experience doing subsetting for open type features at all? Lastly, uh, what font are you using for your slides? Just want to know. Curious. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, um, well, it's possible because in CSS, again, not all, 
uh, modern browser, not all modern browsers support this in, in different ways. But in CSS, as you know, you can you can specify whether you know what which kind of ligatures you want to use, which kind of uh, uh, number case you want to use. So no matter how you uh, split it, you can split it into 10 parts or 100 parts or two parts. As long as you call it in the CSS, it's fine because it's based in, in you know, it's doing character substitution via, via Unicode, I'm guessing. So um, as long as the Unicode, uh, Unicode, Unicode uh, sort of code is not being messed on during the splitting and conversion process, then you're in the clear. Um, so that's the simple question. Like, you still have to deal with the size, right? But that's your problem, right? Because it's like, well, it's large. So um, this font is uh, it's called Dolly, and it is from uh, underwear, W-A-R-E dot N-L. So good, good foundry. So good guys. Thanks. It's a, does a subsetting change the license? If I buy the font and then I subset it and <laughs> distribute it myself, is that allowed under the license that I normally buy it? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. I'm not an expert in, 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 in font licensing, but I can tell you that different foundries might have different uh, policies about this, right? Like some foundries might allow their fonts to be downloaded and, you know, into your machine and then sort of loaded up from your machine. Other foundries actually don't give their fonts away at all as a downloadable web fonts, right? Uh, so for example, I think like, you know, typography.com, like hopefully HNFJ don't allow this. We're like, oh, you either use our cloud service, but you can't use the web fonts, right? So different foundries have different policies about this, but I don't, I don't know enough. But my guess is that you just check with the, uh, with the different foundries. Sure. Uh, just one more question. So is there any hmm, command line to like font forge? So like if I want to go through my database and find out what characters I'm using and then just subset that. Yeah. Is there a way to automate that and uh, run it as part of my build script? Yes, absolutely there is. That's the that's sort of the sh the short the short answer is that there is. Um and Google has some 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 uh, tools in their uh in, in their Google code side. Uh, because when they built the Google web fonts, they're also building that um subsetting tool, right? Checkbox, they actually use I, I think they use like a com command line tool that you can download from Google Code. Uh I haven't done it. I haven't done it the command line way because I sort of just needed to give demo, right? So it needs to be visual. Absolutely you can do it. Thank you.